so it, all it took was to remove an internal battery in the R5 to fix the overheating. Stay tuned. Hey, what's going on everybody? It's Dallin Camry Guy, back at again with a news from around it video for you. Today I've only got two topics. We're looking at the Canon EOS R5 once again, and the new Canon webcam software, and kind of janky, but we'll get into that. First on our story comes from EOS HD. As usual, Andrew Reed has been really hammering Canon with regards to its overheating situation with the R5. Now, whatever opinion you may have about the situation, whether you enjoy the camera or you wanted to get the camera for its high-end video features, you gotta say that we all thought that maybe, just maybe, Canon had stopped using the cripple hammer, but it looks like it could be the case. Let's take a look at the story here over on EOS HD. So title, I have it linked down below. Make sure you check it out. Andrew Reed's just been really on fire with this stuff, quite literally. Uh, removing the internal battery resets EOS R5 overheat timer. And he says, our Canon's pants now completely down. Math class on Baidu now has detailed infrared thermometer readings of the camera's main board with the back off, showing they correspond closely to the temperature reported in the EXIF data and don't rise above 64 Celsius. He also found that if you remove the internal battery, it resets the so-called overheating limitation. So who is telling the truth now, Canon? So the, the main takeaway from here is that, uh, I guess folks in China have been really dissecting this camera and using a thermal camera to see where all the hot points are at. And even though uh, they might use the camera and the camera says it overheats, they quickly see that these particular zones get cool right away. And that's kind of the main takeaway there. Uh, the camera was set to record for 20 minutes of 8K and temperature measurements were made both during and afterward. Peak temperatures were measured of various parts including the CF Express card and battery. No unusual temperatures were measured and it all operated fine during the 20 minute, about as warm as a laptop surfing the net. Nevertheless, the camera overheating warning appeared soon enough and the camera shut down. The end temperature was taken with the back off of the camera with the internal uh, PCB measured directly by the infrared thermometer, the DigiX. It was 64 degrees Celsius, the same as the EXIF data reported. So I guess there, uh, right after it shut down, they went ahead and took a look at it, 64 degrees or so in terms of the hot point. Okay. After two minutes following and an overheating shutdown, the temperature of the internal PCB returned back to 30 degrees Celsius near ambient. So you can see here it's down to 30 degrees Celsius now after just two minutes, um, you know, wait time. This cool down temperature also closely correlates with what my camera reported in the EXIF data, but the timer makes you wait over an hour before normal service is returned in 4K HQ and 8, uh, 8K. After removing an internal, well, before we get into that, see, the point being is the camera seems to actually is able to cool down a lot faster than it makes it out to be, especially with those long delays where people are having to wait 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, four hours, half a day in order to get most of their recording time back in those higher resolution options and high quality options on the R5. But here's the kicker here. After removing an internal button cell battery, however, the overheating timer was miraculously reset and instead of five minutes of recording, the full amount could be shot immediately with no problematic temperature increases. Removing the battery all the time is impractical. The camera will forget settings, at, uh, et cetera, every time you have to reboot, insert date, time, uh, and everything else. And there's the cell battery that's there. Wow, that that is incredible. That this little tiny <laughs> battery cell is the reason why you can't get the higher end video recording uh, formats for a longer period of time. It's a shame. And I don't know. It, it's, it was one of those things where out the gate, it was, one, it was something I said myself after the, the feature specs came out that, yeah, hey, here's Canon coming out, not holding back, giving you a lot of, a lot of features in the camera. And maybe the cripple hammer's over, but it really looks like Canon artificially crippled the camera. Now you could say, of course, again, that it was set up intentionally to prevent the camera from, you know, maybe uh, chewing into their high-end cinema cameras, for example. I get that. I'm not saying that's not the case, but you have to remember that the camera was advertised as a video camera tool shooting 8K, 4K 120p. The video 
advertisements are all there from Canon. Even the people in the videos tell you it, it could be used in a professional environment. They showcase those situations for that camera. But now it looks like it's really just the battery situation. So my thinking is it's, it's, it's all software. So whatever uh, Canon decides to do in terms of releasing new firmware, it means that the, the, the threshold can be improved uh, on Canon's end. And I got to give credit to <coughs> Andrew Reed here because he's really one of the folks that's really pushing Canon to make, uh, to make something of it uh, and actually respond to it. So yeah, I, you know, like I said, again, you could disagree. You can say things like, man, I don't care. I just use it for photography. But it's one of those things where it's like, it's an, it's a really an artificial thing that they're doing there where the camera could get more performance, but they're restricting it. So I, I just think that's pretty janky on Canon's part uh, for them to do that. So we'll see what happens with the firmware update, but people got to keep hitting up Canon about this and, and making sure they respond with it. That's all I got to say, if you really want the features in there. Um, okay. Moving on to the next story, Sony webcam. Let's take a look. So it's coming in from New Shooter. It's been posted everywhere, but uh, here we are on uh, New Shooter here. Today, Sony announced the availability of imaging edge webcam software that will allow Windows 10 uh, PCs to connect 35 different Sony models to their computers. You get the idea. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like Mac OS X support is not available yet, um, but you can use it as a webcam over connection. And some things to keep note is that the aspect ratio is 16 by 9. It's um, your maximum resolution is 1024 by 576 pixels. It does not handle audio. And then you get the list and gamut of camera. Surprisingly, the A6000 is in there, but the 5100 is. Um, but yeah, there's a wide variety of cameras that you can use. I went ahead and tried it out myself. I So basically, you just got to download this file off of their site and then follow the instructions as far as setting up your network connection correctly and setting up to PC remote, depending on which camera you have. So there's some specific instructions based on what camera you have. And then uh, I went ahead and installed it and set up on my 6600 here. I had it set exactly to whatever they were asking for. And then let me go ahead and show you what that looks like via OBS as it's connected right now. And here is the webcam as we speak. So if you take a look, it is janky. It is not moving. It is stuttering. And there you go. That is the, um, yeah, that's the software, folks. It's not great. <laughs> yeah, so it's really just like a little thing that's being used to interface with the, with the whole system. So anyway, I think it's great they're doing it. Maybe there's something up. Let me know if you've had some success using your uh, camera as a webcam. But to be honest with you, um, what I've been doing at work because, you know, I've been doing distance learning, uh, distance teaching, I guess it's not distance learning, but distance teaching. Uh, I, I mean, I use a capture, uh, I use a Elgato cam link for my, for my videos here, but I went ahead and got a, um, let me show it up to you guys really quick. This little cheap guy, and this works just fine for 1080p and it does run audio. Now, I don't think I got one that was like 25 bucks or something like that. I don't have an affiliate with Amazon or anything like that, but just search for uh, USB capture card on Amazon and you can go ahead and find this thing. It works just fine. I haven't had any issues. The quality isn't the same as a high-end option, but I mean, if you're just doing web conferencing and you just want to spice it up a little bit, I mean, this is perfectly fine because the issue with the, with doing the Sony, the Sony option with that is that you don't have any audio. So maybe you already have like a Rode Wireless Go or you already have a microphone that you can use then that might be the way to go. Uh, and you could use that little uh, USB capture video card to do that. So, but you can't do it with, um, through the image editing, the image edge webcam software. But yeah, there you go, folks. Those are my thoughts on these two story topics. Let me know your thoughts on the EOS R5 and the fact that an internal battery is the only reason why it just can't record longer. And also if you tried the webcam software for Sony. And that's gonna do it for me, guys. Don't forget to smash that like button, get subscribed and check out my other content. Catch you later. Peace.